Let's talk a bit, a little bit about um, past transactions because it's important to know how the life of independent power projects and water projects came to being. In 99, we saw a breakthrough in basically how these things were going to work going forward. Abu Dhabi and the UAE in particular was the, as I said, the brainchild behind the structures that we now see today. I think Jonathan alluded to it earlier is that the key thing about these power projects is that when they're being tendered, the transparency is clear and there is no uh, risk of, of skullduggery, as it were. Everyone has to feel that it's a fair process and the, the best bid wins. This adds to the credibility. Abu Dhabi has, seen this prof has profited from this over the last 10 years with approximately one power station or independent water project built per annum. How was this actually dealt with? Well, how they went about it was they had the, the right mix of public and private ownership. Adwaya owns a portion of every project that it builds with Abu Dhabi and the private partners own the rest. This basically attributes itself to the risk transfer that we were talking about earlier. In terms of how the things are put together, it's built around key items such as the offtake agreements, which generally for 20 years plus. In certain other jurisdictions they can be less. Amman tends to see 15 to 20 years and Qatar around 25 years. This isn't in any way particular to the credit quality of that particular country, it's just the way things have, have panned out. Jonathan alluded to earlier as well that um, in terms of the models used, BOT, BOOT, BLT, it doesn't really matter. You know, the key thing is that these things are done within, within time and within budget. I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, key risk. When us bankers look at transactions, we look at where the risks lie and whether there's an appropriate either risk transfer or risk sharing arrangement between the sponsors and the governments. Demand supply of the facility tenor to target markets is needed to be evaluated by independent assessment. We all employ market consultants, technical advisors to ensure that we get the best read of demand supply curves and also the most competitive of the contract. Natural gas supply and access. We tend to look at all the aspects of this part of the process. So reliable feedstock, supply, capacity issues of pipelines, competing demand from other projects, counterparty risk, i.e. the gas entity supply. All this is, is mitigated by contracts. The, the standard process is to have a, a PWPA or PWP with while it's sold merits or with a natural gas supply agreement built around it. Normally the financing are linked to these contracts. In the past we saw merchant towns, obviously with the, the times we've had with the, the, uh, the credit crunch, these have now turned to being uh, linked to shirt towns by a 20 year PWPA. Normally the credit have a door to door turn of 18 to 20 years. If we look at Amman, the gas, the, the gas reserves are supplied under a natural gas contract with the government entity. When we're moving on to the guarantee quantity and quality of gas, this is also very important. What we need to ensure is that the right, right quality of gas is supplied because this impacts um, the efficiency of the plant going forward and hence degradation. Lenders also need to be satisfied that the fees of supply and timing will match the requirements of the commercial operations, i.e. that there won't be a time where the plant is actually ready for operation but there's no gas supply. The next key, key contract is the EPC. Banks would like to see and always want to see a lump sum turnkey contract. 
what this does, it spreads the, the risk between the EPC contractor and the government. Uh, generally, uh, contractors will display successful track records in developing power plants. Performance tests are required for the plant to achieve guaranteed output. The PWPA will always outline efficiency and output levels which will impact the growth damages paid for the contract if these are not met. Economics. Well obviously a project needs to make minimum coverage ratios for basically comfortable to lend against it. It's not uncommon for 120, 125 ratios to be in that region for banks now to be comfortable. The tenor is to match or exceed the financing tenor of the transaction. The tariffs and interest rates are very important. Lenders will take some volume risk and complete price risk. Hence, the cost competitiveness of the project on a global basis is key. The banks like to, like to see an external consultant test what quartile a project is going to fall into, because this is going to be key to its efficiency and economies of scale. Political country risk. Obviously, most of the banks operating in this region are very comfortable with the environment in which they're working. However, we still go for the normal ticks, checks and balances. So we look at the appropriate level of risk mitigation within contracts. Is PRO required? Generally not in this part of the world. Adequate insurance to, to mitigate business interruption and third party liabilities. And what level of third party support are we going to require to cover existing insurance? Obviously there are other factors as well where involving an ECA or a multilateral is important. Um, what we're seeing these days is because of the lack of bank liquidity, it basically adds on to that, to, to that amount of liquidity out there to ensure the projects are viable and can be done. <coughs> Regulatory environmental risk. I think most banks now we call equator banks. <coughs> Quota principles are built around World Bank and, and IFRC uh, requirements. What does that actually mean? Well, basically, we're, we're making sure that every project is built to the required environmental regulations and standards. Local legal regime and enforceability. The project will need to apply to applicable laws, permits, other approval standards.